Arteta! What a score! Benfica both score away goal as the tie ends in a 1-1 draw. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Away goals for both teams, which both count uh, like double. So it actually ended 2-2, uh, which is incredible. Uh, it, it really just a, a, a incredible quirk of math. No, uh, we did get the away goal, despite the fact that both teams were playing away. And I have to credit Paul, who said something on the Instant Reaction Pod on Patreon that I thought was hilarious. And had I been on the pod, which I wasn't, which is all the more reason an advertisement for you to sign up for Patreon and listen to it, um, I would have guffawed and I would have credited him. Tim, who hosted the pod and did a brilliant job doing it, um, I don't think gave Paul his credit. So I want to give him credit now, which is that Paul made the point that uh, it is really a disadvantage to us because we have to play in a foreign stadium twice and Benfica are a foreign team. So they're actually playing at home twice playing in a foreign stadium, which I thought was funny and nonsense and i am here for all the funny nonsense so paul's on twitter pause my pants paul i want to credit you with recognizing that the foreign team gets to play in a foreign stadium twice which is really a, an unfair advantage it was an astute observation on my part i think yes yeah. woohoo. It, woohoo indeed uh tim's on twitter so hello tim hello there uh, kudos to you for the hosting gig uh, on the Instant Reaction Pod. As always, uh, I, I look for the co- through the comments. I troll through the comments so that I can just bathe in the missed Elliot. Where was Elliot? Where was Elliot's hosting? And uh, as usual, <laughs> what I am confronted with instead is, you smashed it, Tim. Great job, Tim. And uh, no mention of me. But you know what? You deserve the kudos. You did a great job, and I, I appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. Yeah, as always. Clive's on Twitter, Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Nobody banter for you, my friend. What I do want to say is we did a live stream pre-match. Uh, Clive was on it. Tim was on it. Paul was on it. Scott was on it. Jessica Black uh, from She Knows Arsenal was on it. <clears throat> and uh, more than 10,000 of you joined us for that. And I want to say thank you for joining us live. It is still available as a replay now if you want to watch it on YouTube. Um, but it was just a lot of fun. We had a really good time. We'll try to do more of that sort of thing, uh, especially as my internet upgrades from cup and string to actual tube a uh, series of tubes. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google, the internet is not a dump truck. It is a series of tubes. And you will see what the chairman of the House Committee on the Internet had to say about the internet uh, some years ago. That was Ted Stevens, I believe, who said, the internet is not a dump truck. <clears throat> it is a series of tubes. So there you go. little uh, political reference for you there, which I know everybody appreciates these days because who doesn't love politics talk? Let's stop with that and let's get to the game. Um, I will let you know that... Uh, I expect this to be a, a tricky conversation because in going through social media and listening to the Instant Reaction Pod and kind of engaging with people's reactions to this game, I think there's a pretty wide spread between people who think this was a very credible performance in a game we dominated, created the chances to win and just didn't finish them. They created nothing but one handball that wasn't a handball and got a penalty they didn't deserve, and the game ends 1-1 when it probably should have been closer to 3 or 4-0. And while I can see that perspective, I also find myself unable, as you might be surprised to hear, to avoid recognizing that they were there for the taking in many ways, and that I think that there was a, a fatigue, a sloppiness, a lot of things that played into this performance that I think prevented us from really smashing them in the way I think they were there to be smashed. And Paul, this is a weird place to start. But I want to start with it because I I think getting the excuse out of the way early, it needs to be addressed. I'm not, I I don't think, I always hate to have excuses for how a team performs, whether good or bad, but I think it should be addressed. So let's just touch on it quickly. This was a game where passes just did not seem to have the right weight on them at any point in the evening with, with a few exceptions where the accuracy of them wasn't what you expect, where the ball wasn't moving with the kind of vibrance than it had been in recent games and legs looked particularly heavy i mean there was one moment where hector bellerin was running and i i assumed that he had one of those parachute things trailing behind him the pitch was incredibly (laughs) i think i remember that yeah yeah yeah. the pitch was incredibly heavy incredibly wet um you know i don't know if this is something that that benfica was in charge of as the sort of surrogate home team where they allowed to determine how they wanted the pitch to be played and you know they just watered the hell out of it or what the case was but i mean do you And and again, I realize this is a silly place to start in some ways, but it is part of the story of the game, so I want to get out of the way. What's your assessment of the extent to which the pitch 
impacted the way we want to play and the way we have been playing? Uh, yeah, I remember one particular moment. Um, I th- it was probably, yeah, it must have been the pe- the penalty they took and the guy, the uh, the dude, Pitsy, uh, spelled pizza but with an I at the end, um, scores and then goes into a slide and his knee <laughs> sticks immediately and he uh, rolls into a tumble. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a very heavy pitch. Yeah. Uh, like just a massive, uh, uh, what do you call it, divot with his kneecap comes out and uh, it's like that's that's a slog and there's other moments like i remember that it, it w- turned out well but the, the chaka slide uh to block that uh, cross shot uh later on in the game and you just kind of th- you see the spray coming up around him and you're like this is well into game time at this stage this is getting into late in the game and this pitch is a mess um and yeah it's going to be a factor and yes, it's going to impact on tiredness because we did. I mean, I wasn't buying before the game, even though we were with the same lineup, that tiredness was going to be a great excuse. I think the fact that we kind of struggled for much of the game to get ahead of them didn't help our legs any either. I think when things are going well, people look a little sparky, but the pitch certainly had its share of it. But I can't say I had any huge thoughts on it, apart from it wasn't bloody helping us. And it doesn't help a team that has five or six um, footballing nymphs and elves picked in its its kind of front lines to ping the ball around, around. And maybe we went for the safer options. And maybe instead of a clever little cutback into midfield to Odegaard, we played it more predictably up the line. But it's hard to measure. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add to that is just that, like, you wonder if it, played a role in the numerous offside calls or things like that, just because the timing of when you, you know, the way you burst off a heavy pitch, the way you hit a pass off a heavy pitch, having to kind of load up, you know, to hit it a little harder, all those little things that changed the tempo, you know, they were playing a bit of a high line. And, you know, I just wonder if that heavy pitch and, and the amount of time it took us to come to terms with how to hit it, when to take that first burst, you know, what the steps across the pitch were going to feel like in terms of really having that that burst of pace. And also if it was leveled the playing field a little bit with some of our faster players going up against some of their slower, older center backs where you couldn't quite burst away the way you might've been able to uh, on another night. So again, I realize it's an excuse yeah. and I don't want to well, try. Yeah, go ahead. What it does encourage me on this conversation is that it seems to be a continuance of the Melliot, the mellower Elliot that we've enjoyed <laughs> recently, the more understanding of our performances, etc. So that I deeply encourage. Yeah, well, and the, the thing is, it's hard to look at this and say it's a terrible performance because any any game where you create three or four pretty clear goal-scoring opportunities and concede virtually none, um, you know, you would be... I think overly harsh to say it's a terrible performance. And yet I think it is fair to look at this performance and say that there was a sloppiness about it. There was a a lethargy about it. The reason I brought up the pitch is, you know, when I picture this game in my mind, I just picture players running slowly through treacle. It just had that, that sort of tempo about it at times. So Tim, let me ask you, I mean, yeah, let's get on with ripping them. Yeah. All right. So, so enough of this excuses. Now let's get into why they were a a, a pack of 11 bastards on the pitch who all deserve to be sacked and have their contracts canceled. (laughs) Um, wouldn't it be funny if like Adu just got drunk on power of canceling contracts and like after one disappointing performance had a couple of glasses of bourbon and just canceled everybody's contract? Be pretty funny. Um, Abamyang, what- your cut, because <laughs> your cut. Yeah, just cut. Yeah, you, know, you can make an argument. You know what? I'm not going there. Um, so, so Tim, he picks the same lineup as Leeds. I, I really have two questions about this. One is, do you think that was the plan, or do you think it was a reaction to a performance against Leeds? Um, that made him feel, I can't change it. And do you think that whether that was the right call or not the right call, that pretty quickly you could see fatigue playing a role in some of the performances? And I think Smith Rowe would be one that you might uh, call upon in terms of, of where a rest could have been helpful. Yeah, I, I think it was maybe a bit reactive. We have seen him do this before. Um, I remember when he first moved to that three at the back and it kind of worked and and I wondered whether it was just like something we'd do in 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 certain games and it didn't turn out to be that way. We just played it all the time. But was it after Wolves he picked the same team for Villa? And and I understood that because he said something like, I, I think we played so well versus Wolves that I wanted to keep that team going. And I, I do kind of get that. And I, I do... So 
before the Leeds game kicked off, I don't think he planned to pick the same team for both games. But then again, I'm not necessarily sure he had his Benfica team totally and utterly in mind. Um, maybe a bit like not bringing Pepe on at all. That made me think, OK, that, that must mean he's starting, um, which obviously he didn't. So, like, I don't think the, the plan was maybe to be drastically different to that. Maybe you have Pepe in... Um, and then, you know, Smith Rowe out, for example, but just really liked what he saw against Leeds and and decided to go for that again. So I, I do think, like, I, I think that maybe this is going to be a theme for them, you know, in the short term for Arteta, that when he sees a good performance, he kind of wants to reward it. And whether that's entirely a tactical thing or maybe a psychological thing for the players as well. As, as for how far fatigue came into it, um, yeah, I think a bit. I think particularly in that last uh, 20 minutes. And I, I know I tweeted on about 72 minutes. I tweeted something about Arsenal have two goals in domestic football this season after the 75th minute, which tells you something about the way we attack, I think. And I still don't think Arteta has quite got... Um, the, the, what Arsenal understood about the last 15 minutes of games, which is that they're unstructured and you just push teams the fuck back and don't worry too much about being clever. Um, and and but, but I do think that there was an, an element of fatigue there. But uh, as you say, Elliot, and as we said on the, the instant reaction as well, this game's really hard to assess because if we take even half of the big, ch- not just chances, big chances we create, you look at this and you say, well, we dominated the game. We got big chances. We scored goals. What's the problem? If that finishes 3 1, we, we're at which it very well could have done without us really doing anything different. We, we're probably talking very, very differently about this. But I guess mm-hmm. what I'm interested in now is what happens for the next two games. And I'm sure we'll come on to that later in the pod. Yeah. I, I mean, the reason it, unfortunately, look, every game is its own story. And the Europa League is its own competition, quite obviously. And I think one that needs a lot of attention uh, because it is probably the the most valuable competition we have going right now. But I don't see how you can go up against Manchester City and the intense pressure we're going to be under in that game now without recognizing that you are going to have to make some major changes to the lineup to keep it fresh and because you are going to need a good performance in the second leg here. Look, while I still feel pretty good about where we are at 1-1 with the away goal, and I thought they were pretty bad, which is encouraging, we won in Greece last year. We didn't just draw. We won away and got knocked out. I'm not saying that's going to happen again, but you approach the game wrong with extreme fatigue, having played Man City at the weekend with an unchanged lineup, and yeah, you can go out next week. So I, I think that has to be on his mind. Clive, the... Well, actually, uh, Tim, you want to add real quick on on the the lineup and fatigue issue before we move on to how they played. That was Paul. Uh, Paul, yes, thank you. I, I I have a hard time telling the two of them apart because in many ways they're really just quite similar. Paul, blame Eddie Longbridge on that. I can't tell myself apart these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, just a quick thought. So lo- one way to look at going with the same lineup is to reward the players. Another is that we're not remotely playing at in the way and the level that he Arteta wants us to get to. And when we kick to a new level, like with Leeds, he kind of wants to say, you know, that's a snapshot. That's uh, a benchmark of a level we're at. I want to see that again. The way we played against Leeds, that's what I want to see next time. So, like, he might have changed players if it was a bit more interchangeable but it wasn't so much reward these players or that was good i want to put out another good team and this seems like it was guys that was it right there capture that in your mind go again again in the next game same lineup and the reason we're playing the same lineup is that is the way i want to see us playing yeah yeah and i mean i i absolutely take that on board you know i think the the issue is we we used the same lineup we used against Leeds, but we definitely did not play in the same way. I think it is important to point that out, at least in terms of the way we used the press. It it wasn't quite the same. First of all, it didn't have the same intensity, and some of that might be fatigue. Second of all, we didn't use that sort of same asymmetrical 4-2-3-1 or 4-3-3 off the ball. If you remember, against Leeds, Odegaard occupied that sort of central position, shadowing the central options for them to play out, and then Aubameyang and Saka kind of split and covered the half space uh, when we pressed 
you know, the first stage of our pressing. We didn't do that this time. This time, Obama was very clearly right up front with Sack and Smith throw out wide and Odegaard behind him. And I think we gave them a little more yeah, room. We, to we were facing in. a three at the back, which was going to be a little bit. And so I we, see it as variations we man on, on the team. We just went man on. Is that what you think? No, I'm just saying it's going to be a little different pressing three center backs yeah, with no, Weigel in front of them. Yeah, very um, fair. So, but but we did press, and and very often we don't. We just I my feeling was we didn't full on press because we the one way they would have got at us was counter attacking. So it was kind of this controlled pressure. It wasn't balls out like against Leeds. It was a variation, um, but but and there's no way that Arteta saw these t- two games were going to play out exactly the same. But the the essence of how we attacked as a team, I think he wanted to, he, he wanted to say that and now some more. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing that's interesting for me here, right, is just that also, like, ultimately, <laughs> we did create some big chances, which is what people are going to remember and say that we had the right to win, but we did just take seven shots in this game. So, mm. like, while we prized them open in some really significant ways on three or four occasions, apart from that, we really did very little. And to, to Tim's point, our last shot, our last shot, I think was in the 74th minute or so. So, you know, we, well, let me look. I have it right here. 72-54 was the last shot we took. So, you know, I, I don't know that that's, <clears throat> that's, you know, fantastic work. Pardon me, 71-34. So, Clive, <clears throat> I want to talk uh, in just a little bit about how Benfica played because I think it contributes to why I'm a little frustrated with this. Mm-hmm. I think Benfica gave us a big opportunity here that we didn't take. But let's talk central midfield because I think you and I have a slight disagreement about the Ceballos performance. I, I think we'll probably agree it wasn't Shaka's best day. You are more frustrated with Ceballos generally um, than I am. I would have agreed with you that he hasn't been great. But in this game, I thought he was one of our better performers. But you have sort of a theory about that. Do you want to talk about the the dynamic of the central midfielders and maybe we can have a little little tussle over the Ceballos performance? Hey, so, so Ceballos is, whenever I say I'm not enamored with somebody, it's normally it's normally how they play and what they see and what they do in uncertain moments. So, so I look at Ceballos, I, I see a player that when he comes in the team from being out from the team, I think he plays a really good game. So he's somebody that cares about being in the first 11. He wants to play, so he does exactly what he should do, really quick, really intense. He's quite hard to miss because he he transmits his performance to the watching public. Right? So people like him because he's quite a highlight reel. But then when he when he feels comfortable, I think you heard me say it before. I think he gets a little bit overexpressive. He starts to feel himself. Mm-hmm. Right? So by that, I think he has too many touches. He likes to stroke the ball. He it's turns a pandemic, Clive. I mean, I think most of us are starting to feel ourselves <laughs> if we're being honest. But go ahead. <laughs> he drops the he drops the ball off, then he trots away to the other side of the pitch where he should be in the positional zonal system that we should be. He should be on the right centre mid. He doesn't want to be there, and so he starts to move around. And then now, with my brain, I start to get frustrated when I look at the, the numbers around this game. We had ten offsides. Right, ten offsides. That seems like quite a lot. I'm not sure if that's a, ten a regular nil, number, by the way, which is pretty <laughs> exciting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, ten offsides, and so, and I'm looking at these games. So, how, why do offsides happen? Right, they, they, it's, it's a, it's a lack of timing. You don't see the opportunity. Either timing from the fours or lack, a lack of connection and cohesion from centre midfield. Right, so there was. I felt in this game, there was a lack of ruthlessness in the opponent's box. But there was a lack of ruthlessness in our approach to get into the opponent's box. When you're playing a team and they're offering you all the Christmas presents, don't turn away from them because they've got analysts too. They can adjust. They can drop their back line eventually, like they did in the last third of the game. You take what's on offer. You don't turn away from it and internalize in your performance. So from my angle, I'm looking at it thinking, I don't care you made a slight tackle here. I don't care you played that ball inside to Bellerin on that on that, on that open goal. And it's really interesting. One of the key indicators that you can judge performance, when they scored and we basically woke up, do you notice how efficient we were on their goal? Mm. Bang, over the top, one touch, one touch, across the area, one touch inside the fullback, fullback, taking on his left foot, no messing on your right foot. Left foot, cross, 
tap in. All that crap beforehand and overindulgence was gone because they had to perform a 1-0 down Europa League game, which is significantly important for the club. So that shows you what they were not doing beforehand. They weren't engaged as a team, but particularly for me, the brain of the team is your interior, and it's how you use the Odegaard, Tobias, Shaka situation, and I don't think our wide players used him appropriately, which you spoke about last night, particularly Odegaard. And I think Tobias was not positionally disciplined to really take the Christmas presents that was on offer. You got a 19 year old kid that had for Tongan two slide tackles in the first minute where he almost ripped his groin to part. Feed him, <laughs> feed him, feed him. Don't turn away from him, feed him. You know, it's just knowing what's on offer, that game recognition. So, if I guarantee you, I'll tell you now, if I say this now, someone's going to have a two minute on him, which is going to look fantastic. But from a game recognition and a game management point of view, I think he was one of the chief guys for not realising that this team was there for the tanking. So maybe I've got some Olympiakos scars. Fair comment, right? Mm. Not the end of the world. This team are crap. We'll beat them next week. But I want, what similar to what Paul said, we pick the same team to play the same way, right? And we didn't. And one of the reasons was they went long ball a lot because they didn't want to get pressed like Leeds did. So they were quite smart, but they were giving us, they were giving us the grass and we didn't take it. And I want this team to be better. It's not about Sabayas' performance. I want it to be better. But I'm going to do a little comparison. I don't know how sharp any of it. But I look at Sabayas and I look at a player that I took time to warm to. No qualms in saying this. It took me a while to see Seth Fabregas. Right? It took me a while to see him, to see what he had. I thought, oh, crikey, he's got it. Now, you compare the two players, right? They both play behind the ball. They're both physically challenged. Right? I ask you the question, do you think Seth Fabregas lets that team get away with that last night? Or is he dropping the ball over, one touch over top? Clive, I'm going to tell you something that's going to massively disappoint you. Danny Ceballos is not Seth Fabregas. (laughs) I'm not not giving him that kind of credit. You're not, you're not, I need you to listen to this, mate. It's important, right? There are two players that play behind the ball, Mm -hmm. right? Seth Fabregas recognizes what's on offer. He takes that he takes what's on. They can both spread the ball. They can both pass the ball. They're both quite rhythmic. They're both not physically supreme, but one knows how to cut you, and the other one does it when he chooses. Mm. Do you see what I mean? And that's the difference. It's not about comparing players. When I say that, think about the attributes of the player, the physical attributes. He's not a monster. They're both not physical monsters. They can both play that Spanish rat attack way. But I'm think, I'm, I do not see Seth Fabregas from an intelligence point of view letting that team get away with what they got away with last night. Yeah, and of course not. Of course not. And I, like, let's be clear. You know, if I say that, um, I'm trying to think of a good example here. You know, if I say that Mohamed El Neni had a good game, <clears throat> I'm not saying that Mohamed El Neni is a good player, right? I'm saying that he had a good game. I think Danny Ceballos is a player who at, what is, is he 24, 23, 24, right? I think, um, who's, so. you know, early I'd prime. go with 24. <clears throat> yeah. He's 24 until he's 25, unless he's 23, in which case he's 23 until he's 24. But a guy who is <clears throat> early prime, pre-prime, you know, coming into his prime, who if everything kind of goes right and he hits his ceiling performances more often than not, can be a really useful squad player in an Arsenal team that has two first choice central midfielders. I do not see Danny Ceballos as a first-choice central midfielder for Arsenal, although I think there are games where he plays at a level where he can be the complementary piece to a better player like Thomas Partey. I just think that he was good in this game in the main in a team that overall underperformed what they could have done. I mean, he, he and he is in fact 24. Um, he was second in the team in deep completions, he led the team in final third entries. And I mean, even when Shaq is bad, he leads the team in final third entries. Today, to, or last night, it was Danny Ceballos. He was among the leaders in all of our defensive stats in terms of tackles and ball recoveries and things like that. And, you know, if we're going to be fair, if we want to be fair about taking responsibility and understand what's happening, because <clears throat> I often overlook defensive contribution, we gave the ball away cheaply at one point. We, we, we gave them almost no chances in this game. But the most dangerous move they had was a giveaway they moved it up the left wing. Maybe one of you guys can describe it better than I can because I, I, I don't know the players involved because I don't follow Benfica at all. Is that before? They, oh, okay. 
and they cross it, there's an open man in the... I mean, it's going to be a goal or a really good chance. And Ceballos races back and like shoulders it, heads it, shoulders it away with a really nice recovery run to get between the cross and the man um, after a turnover. That counts. Before halftime when Shaka <clears throat> switched the ball, I think he was. Yes, yeah. Know, yep. Might have been yeah. that one, I'm not sure. And, and again, that counts. So, you know, I, I look at that and I say, he sets Bellerin through for the ball that should have been the goal, our best chance of the game. He facilitates that. He clears the biggest danger of the game, apart from the penalty. And, you know, the rules still prevent you from running in between a penalty and the goalkeeper. Uh, so, you know, all in all, in a mediocre game, I thought he <clears throat> mostly showed a, a decent amount of presence in, in the big moments without without being sensational. Uh-huh. And I will say this, Clive, and I, re- I agree with you on this. I felt he was a contributor to the backwards passing coming back, to some of the crab passing coming back. I think he and Chaka both were guilty of not finding Odegaard more, who Agreed. was really driving us forward, popping into good positions, and was ignored too much. If Thomas Party starts that game, we win it 25 nil. I have no doubt. Yeah, I agree. Thomas agree. Party changes the dynamic of that game. And a big if you want to pick on Ceballos for anything, so, not finding Odegaard more would be the thing I'd pick on. It's not a pick, it's not a massive pick on Ceballos per se. It's a massive pick of our interior and how we used it. Mm-hmm. You know, and and the, our interior and in that three connect to our front three. And I felt we were a little bit we came back to the ball a lot more than we did the weekend. We didn't run away from it. We just didn't do what we should have done in the right way. And and I, I got I looked at the game in almost three thirds. And the first third we looked at this and thought, oh, they're rubbish, we should win this and played around. And then we didn't quite execute before when we should have done. The goals change everything. Goals change everything. We know that. We would have scored. We could have just done. We just played two nil football, nil nil. Basically, that's what we did. Right. So, um, and and then we when we we finally had to wake up in the in the third third, (laughs) and then we ended up thinking, correctly, we got a game. You know, the game sort of died towards the end. I almost dismissed the last little quarter. Maybe it's a better way to describe it. The last twenty. Because it was just a nothingness then. I think fear came in. And this is my issue. Fear came in because the rules of European football are they're not the same as normal games. And in particular this year, we're traveling to another stadium in, in another country, a foreign country, Paul, another foreign <laughs> country playing a foreign team. And basically, it's unfair. you know what? They've got, they've, got full, they've got the full 90 and extra time with away goals. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to lose, but just, Know the competition you're playing in. Know what's on offer. Sort them out. Get your boys off. You've got Man City at the weekend. You know, be a bit smarter. Be a bit smarter. And I just, I carry that frustration. Maybe not for Benfica, but just in general. Can we up the brain? Can we up the intelligence? Can we do that as a group of people and recognize what's on offer for you? You know, and um, and that's maybe not. I think. So Bias epitomized that in my eyes more than others. But I also recognize he had some highlight moments. And the two-minute highlight too is going to be fantastic. And he had a he had spectacular passes, spectacular blocks. Everything was nice and bombastic. And people said, what a great game. Well, a great, I want a great game when we're 3-1 up. I want a great game. I know we missed chances. So it's not his fault. But there was opportunity to beat that team. And I felt the car drivers didn't drive the car properly. Mm, yeah. Okay. So then let, let me, uh, t- well, we're going to lose Paul in a minute here. So let me come back to Paul just for a second before he's gone. Cause Tim, there's, there's a topic that I know you were sort of interested in covering. So I, I want to make sure you get to it, but do you, do you want to add on the, on the central midfield issue, Paul? I think yeah. Odeg- Odegaard was a player who I thought his influence waned as the game wore on. And in part, because I thought that the team did a less, a, a worse and worse job of finding him. Um, and, you know, I, sometimes you got to credit the opposition for neutralizing something, but I don't think that was the case here. I think we did a poor job of of getting the ball to him as the game wore on because, for me, he was one of the guys that when he was on the ball, that was when we looked like we had the greatest threat to, to really cut them open. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm blessed by not having Clive's football understanding, which means that I can watch Danny Sabias' performance in this and mostly think, God, he was very good. Apart from when him, Chaka, and most of the teams decided it'd be a good idea to take extra touches and start playing back, there were phases of this game where we got kind of cautious and 
it was one of those games that needed a goal, the old cliche. Unfortunately, it really needed a goal from us. But we got a goal from them, and suddenly we kicked into life, went for it, and immediately responded. And you'd think to yourself, oh, you think to yourself two things. Why didn't we do this before? And you also think, oh, this this is going to be fine now. We've woken up and it's going to be like Leeds and we may not have four games or four goals coming this game, but we got a couple more coming our way. Um, we created some chances. Um, I, I definitely think we had the issue that we're playing with a 10 and when it's not, it's one thing when you come out with a game plan to use your 10, but after a game or two, you kind of fall into old habits. And I just don't think we were using uh, Odegaard, who's an 11, um, well enough uh, once we kind of settled into old habits and old rhythms. But that's that's just kind of, maybe that's just a cliche in my head that we weren't using the 10 we had because at, at many times we played it up the wing and did clever things between Sabias, Bellerin, etc., when you would see times when Odegaard was just in a great spot and you look where the goal come from and that pass, th- that <clears throat> the vision Odegaard had centrally uh, was where that goal came from. So I, I still think this is mostly a game where we miss, where we'll rue the chances and that totally influences how we see this game. Except for the last 15, 20 minutes where it seemed to me we decided we didn't want to lose this. We had Olympiacos on our mind. We were tired. It was a heavy pitch. And as you said, uh, Clive, the game kind of became a bit of a nothingness. It wasn't just you weren't in the mood. They weren't in the mood. Um, And everybody threw on the subs towards the end just to kind of slow everything down. Let's not lose it tonight. Um, I thought Sabias and and Chaka were mostly very good apart from the phases in which the team kind of just played it safe. Mm. I don't I don't know if I would say the same of Shaka who I I thought could have could have done a little more in ball progression this game. I, I thought this was not one of his better games, but to be fair, he, he could have I th- look, I thought he uh, you know, I wouldn't go out massively on Shaka. I thought he had his moments. I definitely thought this was a game in which he's very comfortable to let the player who's hopping who's feeling it do their thing. Uh, he was quite left. He was quite kind of let Thomas Partey do his stuff. Um, and a lot of the action was up the right wing in reality. <clears throat> and I was okay with that. It's very hard to have two Poppin, Cracklin midfielders zinging it all game long. So uh, I wouldn't, I'm not going too strong on, on Chaka. I think uh, he was, you know, decent Uh, going forward and also shared the tendency to go backwards a a little too much a la Uh, Danny, but he let Danny kind of lead the charge. I'll never be a Shaka. I'll ask you one one, I know. Can I ask you one question, mate? When you said if Thomas Party plays him in 20, I know exactly what you mean, but why do you say that? Why do you say that? Well, I mean, first of all, I think he is a player who is relentless in his desire to push the ball forward. I think he is a little more intelligent about where his pass goes and a little quicker to deliver it. Um, I also think in a game like this, you know, sometimes when Ceballos eludes pressure, he eludes the pressure, but then the move doesn't go anywhere. You know what I mean? So he'll he'll draw a man That's onto exactly him, it. but sometimes he'll like beat that man and then not go anywhere with it. Once party beats that man, he stays beaten. He's going up the pitch and he's looking to push it forward. And that creates mismatches. Um, you know, and I, I just think, I think Ceballos... Is, is a good passer in small spaces, but maybe not as, as good a passer in longer spaces, and Party can can play in behind the, the high line better than Ceballos. I mean, he's just a better player than Ceballos. Like that's, but the thing is, you, you, you could also make it. the argument, you, you what if it be. was him instead of Shaka? I mean, you know, it's funny. We say Smith Rowe's fatigued. He needs a rest. Or Saka needs a rest. The player we never talk about needing a rest is Shaka, and he plays every game for 90 minutes. You know, So he probably needs one too. I think you've nailed where my little bit of a colored view came from. I think... Is is that we are missing that exactly what you described there with party exactly exactly it and I suppose I I carried that frustration with the whole thing. There's no one's lost anybody here at least on the end of the world. Do you know what I mean? But mm. I just saw so much promise since in the last few games where I just didn't see this and I saw some old tendencies coming back and it just frustrated me. Yeah, well, um, 
Well, there's some other things that, that I think are really interesting here. We haven't even touched on the Obama Yang thing yet, and he is in many ways the story of this game. I, I think it's important to point out, like, you can play a team that's there for the taking, who is ostensibly pretty bad, and create three guilt edge chances, but really only take seven shots. And wind up with a game like this where you can, if you want, say we should have beaten them 3-0. We created the chances. What's to complain about? Alternatively, you can look at the other way, which I'm sort of torn between, which is we had seven shots against a terrible Benfica that was there for the taking. We were offside 10 times. We didn't execute. And had we executed even a little bit, this tie is dead, you know? So I I think both of those perspectives are, are available. Sorry, Clive, did you throw something else in there? No, I'm just saying there's not enough, is it? That's no, not enough chances yeah. for that for that game. There are three great ones, enough. but there should have been... I mean, look, there should have been more. So, uh, well, first of all, Paul, do we have to let you go? Yes, I'm okay. off. Paul's on Twitter. Pause my pants. Thanks, pause. Woohoo! Woohoo, indeed. Okay, so there's a lot more to get to here, and I, I, I want to turn it over to Tim to talk about the Aubameyang thing, because uh, largely uh, because I think he and I see it the same way. So I always like to talk to people <laughs> that have the same perspective I do. Um, but before I do that, Tim, do you want to just quickly touch on the fact that I think some of the frustration here comes from something you touched on in the instant reaction pod, which is simply they've got two old central defenders, a not particularly positionally sound central midfielder. They were playing this weird system. I know we're calling it a high line, but it wasn't quite that. What it was, their front mm. line pressed but their back line stayed back a bit and there was this yeah. chav- chasm in midfield. So we'd beat the press easily, then carry it 20 yards forward. And then their poor old defenders had to try to track the runs of our forwards with no support. It was the weirdest. I mean, I hate to say it. I think maybe their coach is bad because the system didn't make the slightest bit of sense to me. Now, granted, he just got a one, one draw against Arsenal. So he's laughing all the way to the bank. But like the frustration for me comes from thinking, they were absolutely there for the taking. And so before we turn this into an Obamian discussion, is that really it? Is it just the fact that, especially yeah. early in the game, we'd beat their press, we'd run at their back line, there was no resistance, and we just repeatedly failed to turn that into anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, with uh, Jose Jesus, I, I watched a lot of his Flamengo team last season. And, um, you know, look, in, in Brazil, Jose, Jose Jesus is a, a revolu- revolutionary coach because they have a poisonous co- coaching culture where they sack uh, managers every six to eight weeks but mm. um and so you know I, I watched a lot of his flamengo team and and it, and and they were i mean they were really really good but they were playing like quite bog standard tactics that have been around in europe for the last five to ten years um that that haven't you know that uh, that a lot of brazilian teams don't play i I felt in this game, like even when Abamyang missed, um, so let's fold it into the Abamyang discussion, I guess. Even when he missed that chance, even at half time, I wasn't that worried because I was looking at it and I was just thinking, like these guys are going to cough up loads of chances, and and that's the crux of this game, right? They kind of did, but I was looking at it and I was thinking, however we want to do this, like Sack has got them on toast, basically. Um, well, so I basically, I thought our right side functioned really well. I was like, Saka and Bellerin have got them on toast. Abamyang's finding space in behind. We're all right on that side, slightly less functional on the left side, which I think is kind of understandable when you've got two right footers, neither of whom are totally natural out there. And and so I was kind of looking at this thing, and we had David Luiz dropping the ball, you know, who can just drop that ball over the top. And I was just thinking... Right, we're going to keep getting behind them like that. That is absolutely set now, and we like Vertonghen and Otamendi. These are players we know as well. We know that if you panic Otamendi, he'll swipe your legs or he'll pull a shirt or something like that. He he did that when he was in his twenties, let alone when he's thirty three. <laughs> so I, I was, you know, I was looking at it, and even at half time, I, I sent a, like a, a fairly um, composed tweet where I was just like, "This is kind of fine. Keep doing this, and we'll be fine." And and yeah, you're right. I like. I don't think we ever pressed home that advantage. I felt like, and I guess this is an extension of what Clive said. Really, we were playing like we were two nil up. That we played almost as if we planned to have those exact chances and then sit off. It's just those exact chances didn't go in. 
and you know particularly in the last like one of the reasons as well i i guess i i get quite annoyed isn't the right word i think concerned is more the word and i keep going on about this like arsenal not pressing home the advantage when they have it it's it's not the missed chances that bother me in that and it it bothered me when arteta was talking in november and december about us not being ruthless enough with like the one chance that we made because that that to me is to me the ruthlessness is to keep getting in behind and keep creating and um and and that's what that's what kind of I, I feel like this arsenal team is afraid to dominate i feel like they're afraid to do that for more than 15 minutes or so because nowadays as well coaches change things like in the middle of a game like it's the game is much more tactically astute nowadays like it's not like it's not like the invincibles days where everyone turns up with 451 and arsenal have figured out after 10 minutes but that like the 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 opposing team don't talk about it till half time if if a team's getting caned after 15 20 minutes they change something so that's why you've got to press the advantage home that's why you've got to force them backwards mm-hmm. and um i just don't feel like arsenal ever quite do that like they they look like they're on the cusp of it but there's just something that holds them back and um yeah i i think you can see that a lot of arsenal's play like look at look at a lot of arsenal's goals this season they've got the training ground stamped all over them like almost all of them which is why the tierney goal at west brom really stood out there's very few oh wow that was just like a bit of inspiration or that was someone saying right i can see that i can see this defender's weak i'm gonna go for him you know it's it's very like we must do what the coach said at all. Like it's it's a little bit robotic, and and maybe that's just me um, projecting something I assume onto the team. But I I just feel I don't know I I don't quite know what it is, but I just feel this reticence in Arsenal that they're afraid to that they like dominating the centre circle but not the penalty area. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I I definitely think there's some of that, and what's frustrating for me is I don't. I feel we'd been moving away from that a little bit more. I think we had, to use mm. Paul's analogy, pushed that toothpaste up the tube a bit more. And this was a night where we sort of stopped doing that. Now, look, the offside played a big role too, Tim, right? Because there's multiple, multiple occasions, I mean, 10 different times where we're yeah. potentially in or into a dangerous situation that we're all called but, back for offside. 10 times a lot. <laughs> Even even that. So let's fold this into the Aubameyang discussion, okay. right? Yeah. Even that didn't worry me that much. Even at half time, I I completely understand, and it and it was annoying. Let's have it right. Like we we were offside too many times. But even that at half time, I was thinking, but that's okay because that means we're trying to get him behind, and maybe that you know they're not timing it right, or whatever. The ball's not arriving quite quickly enough, or a mixture of both. But that means we're trying to get him behind, and and getting caught offside like that, it's a bit like missing chances. Like you 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 can get caught offside four, five, six times. You only got to get it right once. Yeah. Um, and get through. Which and, we did that, <laughs> three it, times, four just, times. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's and we did that twice. Like the the goal and the Abamyang miss chance are identical, right? Mm. They're identical moves, um, essentially. But I and and I guess that's that's how I feel about. Um, I, I guess like how I feel about attacking in general is it's about volume, and it's the same with chances. So to to you know turn this into the Abamyang discussion should like. So first of all, the first one is the egregious miss, right? That that's the bad miss. Even even though that's, I think that was showed up at zero point five xg. So that's a fifty fifty chance for Aubameyang. No, you'd say it's more than that, um, and and he should definitely score. I think the second shot, I, I think there's nothing wrong with that at all, um, really. And the third one, yeah, he should just take it on his left foot. Yeah, kind of stuff you see all the time, though. And the the impression of the first miss governs how we feel about the other two. But when he missed that chance, I, I wasn't worried because I thought, well, another one's coming. Um, you know, if, if we keep giving him those chances, then then he'll score. And and I guess. Like the, and this is perhaps where data and XG and things like that have slightly changed the game, because when I look at the um, the best goal scorers around, they just take tons of shots, and they accept that most of them are going to most attacks don't produce a shot, most corners produce nothing. 
you know, m- most of the positive things you try to do on a football pitch are largely futile. Yes. Um, it's a very low scoring game over quite a long period of time. Right. And what the best forwards understand is volume. And um, Tim from 7am kickoff tweeted a really nice table um, at me this afternoon because he was agreeing with my point. It, it, and it was it can cont- he looked at Arsenal, Man City, Liverpool and the players who had the most big misses like Salah uh, from last season, Salah's numbers, Firmino's numbers, Mane's numbers, huge. Like Aguero's were were above Aubameyang's in terms of big chances The missed. best teams when, and when, the best players miss the most shots and most big chances of yeah. any team or any player. Yeah, it, it's it's that it's that um, Wayne Gretzky thing, isn't it? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. But Scott, if you watch it, I just urge anyone, um, just absolutely urge anyone the next time you watch Liverpool just count to yourself how many times Salah and Mane fuck up how many times Salah's greedy and um, doesn't play the pass and tries the shot and everyone gets angry at him count the amount of times Mane tries a back heel and or an overhead kick and it doesn't come off it's loads but the point is they keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it because they know that they've only got to get it right once. Like they would be awful NBA players where every fucking shot counts or tennis players where you've got to hold your serve and stuff like that. But that is not the sport football is. And I was looking at, um, just to wrap this up, I was looking because I, I wanted, well, I say I wanted to challenge my assertion. Really, I wanted to support my bias on this. Mm. So I looked at um, some stats from La Liga because I've been really interested in what Suarez is doing with Atleti this year, where they've just turned him into a pure penalty box player and he's just scoring goals by the shitload. And I looked at the top 10 goal scorers in La Liga at the moment. In terms of shot accuracy, Suarez is second bottom in that intersection of top 10 goal scorers still the top scorer he misses more shots than nine of those 10 players but he still scores more because volume is important and that and and so i'm not saying like abamyang shouldn't have scored of course he should have of course he had like a bad night in front of goal but if you keep giving abamyang those chances like just keep doing that over and over and over again and give me that striker elliot give me the striker that gets two or three big chances a game and maybe misses some than the striker who gets like one big chance every three to four games any day. Yeah. Well, I mean, I obviously agree with you here. I want to get Clive's opinion on this, but like, I think it is important to say if you think that missing big chances stinks, that's totally fine. It does. Um, It does. It does. It stinks, but that doesn't necessarily mean the player stinks. Um, And I would think quite the opposite. But here's what we can all agree on. That if you stink, one of the best things you can do, you could shower. You could do that. Um, But maybe you don't have time for a shower. Maybe you don't want to waste water. Well, one way to make sure you don't stink is to just spray yourself with great cologne. This is a brand new Manscaped ad, my friends. That is what we are doing right now. Because Manscaped has a cologne. And I have to tell you, When you have built your reputation on making a certain part of the body look and feel the best it can, and you branch out, that uh, that can lead people to be skeptical. You can count me among the skeptics, but I got to try the cologne, and I got to tell you something. It is absolutely fantastic. Comes in a beautiful glass bottle. It smells great. And, uh, you know, look, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I sprayed it on just, you know, around the house. And my wife, not knowing what was going on, walked by me about an hour later. And her exact quote was, oh my, come back here a moment. You smell nice. And I can tell you that that led to a wonderful uh, little evening of of marital bliss in our household, which is something you don't need to know about, but now you know about it. And I feel ashamed for having shared it, but it's out there now and I'm not editing this. So I do want to read you something because I don't, look, I, I think I can be a wordsmith in some ways. I can be a little bit silly, but what I am clearly not cut out for is writing the description of a, of a cologne. So let me read this description. You tell me if you think you could do this job. It is described as calming and inviting. The signature scent introduces a light citrus burst before settling into the anchoring notes of vetiver and a woodsy masculine finish. I don't even know what vetiver is. Tim, you're a wordsmith. Do you know what vetiver is? Uh, no, but I um, it's quoted in an REM song, um, and it's doing my head in 
which REM song it's in. I'm going to have to look it up. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If REM likes vetiver, then you better believe it's good. This 50 milliliter spray clone is even hypoallergenic, cruelty-free, dye-free, paraben-free, and 100% vegan. So you can buy a bottle of it, and when fans are allowed back in the Emirates, you can spray it all over Hector Bellerin, and he won't have the slightest problem with it. So there you go. It's um, You, you could just get the perfect package 3.0, which comes with everything. All the stuff to take care of your private area, the lawnmower 3.0, and the cologne. You do however you want to do, but you go try this cologne. Because you know what? Being stuck around the house stinks. Maybe you stink. Do you stink? You know what? You're not going to stink anymore. Stop stinking. Why did why they didn't have to write all that stuff? They could have just written stop stinking. Stop stinking. Start smelling nice. That, now that, why don't I work on Madison Avenue? Why don't I work in advertising? Stop stinking. Start smelling nice. Go to manscaped.com. Promo code Arsenal Vision. 20% off. Free shipping. You still get the lawnmower 3.0, which you should do. And now once you're all cleaned up downstairs and you don't stink and the pandemic's over and you run out into the street and you drop your drawers and you're smelling great, I think it's going to be a good day for you. And I can vouch for the fact that it led to uh, a perfectly fine experience in my household. So now that that is all the done. The REM. Yeah. The REM song is? Yeah. Uh, find the river. Find the river. There you go. Find the river. And... um. Go to uh, manscaped.com, promo code ArsenalVision, 20% off and free shipping. And as we always do, we have to check in with Clive to make sure that this section is done. Clive, is that is that sufficient? Yeah, man, that's so sufficient. <laughs> that's plenty. <laughs> I got to tell you, my favorite, my favorite feature of the Manscaped ads is getting Clive's awkward, uncomfortable reaction, desperate for it to be over. Clive, let's talk uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang a little more. I, I mean, look, this is this is the debate. So let me ask you, because this is where I think stats and analytics have absolutely changed football in some ways. Did Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang have a bad game or a good game? This is a trick question in some ways, because I think 15 years ago, every single football fan would have said, what are you talking about? He had a terrible game. But we, we have come to sort of evolve in our understanding of what a forward is supposed to do, what a striker is supposed to do. Is this a bad Pierre Emerick Aubameyang game or a good game or somewhere in between? How do you evaluate it? Yeah, this is the beauty of the game, right? So last night we did uh, stock rising and stock falling. And I think Aubameyang had to be a stock falling, but he could easily have been a stock rising. And the same for Daniel Sabias, by the way. You know, he stock falling. But it depends how you look at the game. So if you think a striker's job is just to score goals and, that, and you missed a couple of chances, and as far as you're concerned... My evening was average because, mate, you didn't score. Aubameyang had a bad game. I, I look at it and think, you know what? Based on what I saw against um, Leeds, he scored a hat-trick, but his movement was even better in this game. He was reading Odegaard's passes off the left foot, which we spoke about earlier. He read them much better this time. He's great in different angles. He's taking a shot from the right-hand side, from the left-hand side. I'm thinking, mate, you look like Arsenal centre-forward. Now, we just got to get the right people around you, so... As far as I'm concerned, that's a done deal. Nothing to see here. We've got to send a centre forward, and that's how you preserve your franchise player who's 31, 32. Very, very simple. It's done. It's completely done. And for me, in this game, and, and how the issue was, not him missing chances, it was us creating enough of them. Right. So our, our build-up to him was not as efficient as it could be. Right. So we didn't maximise our superiority, as I said earlier on. So... Aubameyang to me is um, that's it now. I, I don't think it's a, I just that's it. It's over for anyone else trying to get behind him. It's over when he plays like this. When he's moving like this, I know he missed some easy chances. There's just no one close to him, and and the variety of goals he can score from different positions he can score from, how he can carry the ball, he can create his own shot. He, he's just a mile away, and now we have to get somebody else who sits alongside him and maybe can help the team crack the low block scenario when people are in their box and we haven't got the ability to diagonal cross, you know, using the aerial threat because the space is not there. That's the scenario we have to plan for next when we get even better on the ball and have better centre halves that can sprint into corners and we can press people into their own half of the pitch and then teams are going to drop away even further. And what do we do then? Like Aston Villa, for example, what do we do then? Can we crack that code? And we haven't quite done that yet, you know? So... Yeah, I, I do like what's developing here. He's turning into the Vardy, as we said before, and we're going to have a good 18 months or so with this player. And um, it's just how we um, preserve him and manage his legs going forward. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, I think th this is really tough for me because what I would say is you want 
every single Pierre Emerick Aubameyang game to be just like this one. That's what you want. Because if he gets three big or nearly big chances a game, he's probably going to score a goal a game, if not more. And he had five chances at the weekend, and he scored three goals. He had three chances in this game. He scored no goals. And it, it's an outlier. I mean, it is an outlier. You have to be realistic about what you want from Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. As long as Pierre Emerick Aubameyang is on the ball, in the box, close to goal with a chance, you can say he's doing exactly what we want him to do. There were a couple offside, by the way, that were a whisker away from being in. There was also the one, you know, there was really a fourth chance where I think he maybe got caught slightly on his heels, but the keeper did really great to come out quick. It was on the right channel, and he's in. And I, I was surprised the keeper got there. You guys remember that one? He was in. The yeah, keeper. defender yeah. fell over, didn't he? And, yeah. um, and suddenly the keeper appeared out of the TV screen out of nowhere, so he read it really well, right? So, um, Yeah. Because he was in there. So, again, it's a threat that we've got there. I think we just messed up a little bit. I think we didn't need to throw, in my opinion, this game. We could have saved him for the... The, the, the midfield security that we that we need, sorry, midfield security we need mm -hmm. against City, we could have done with a Pepe out there dashing in behind on that side. There's no way they could have tracked the three of them. No chance, you know. And uh, where Smithrow came back to the ball, we didn't really get centre midfield control in the high zone 14 area, if you know what I mean, around in the midfield 10 space. We didn't really get that massive advantage because we didn't use it. As Pifferell's coming in there, and he found himself on the edge of the game where I think a, another striker on the outside, you know, a forward-thinking player, would have um, obliterated them. Yeah, and, and I mean, ultimately, look, I, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying Aubameyang gets a pass for missing big chances. Of course he does not get a pass for missing big chances. He has to be criticized for it. I'm not saying don't criticize him for missing it. I'm saying these. this is what he's on the pitch to do. He's on the pitch to get into those positions and score goals. Because he did not score goals, he deserves very much so to be criticized. I mean, absolutely, without question. But if he plays like that every game and does that every game, that's exactly what you want from him. I mean, you know, it's great. I, I, I think we can all agree on this, or at least I believe we can agree on this. And, and Tim, just maybe one or two sentences because then I want to move on, but just... As long as he's doing this, we're fine with Oba. Keep starting Oba if he's doing this, right? If he's getting into the box, he's getting on the ball in those kind of positions. I mean, he's proven it his whole career. Look, if he was a 22-year-old, you'd say maybe he's just a choke artist. Maybe he, he can't score goals. He's been a 30-goal-a-season guy. He's been a, a 1 XG per 90 guy in his career. I don't have any worries about Aubameyang scoring goals. So as long as he's doing that, we're fine with him, right? Yep, absolutely. 100%. It, yeah, it's the same. It's the, and, and there is a trend for this at the moment with strikers over 30, Cavani, Vardy, Suarez. Um, yeah, absolutely no, no compunction about that whatsoever. This, this is, this is good Abamyang, and he's not running back to protect fullbacks and stuff like that. So long may it continue. Yeah. So then I, we don't have to spend a lot of time on him because I don't think it was a masterclass game. But just a quick mention for Saka. I mean, again, a player who comes to the rescue, scores the goal we needed, um, you know, three shots, one shot in prime, three open play shots, one big chance, one goal. A player who, whether he's playing great or not great, whether we're dominating or not dominating, has become a guy you can trust to just pop up and be decisive, and he does it again. I mean, is there is there much to say about him in this game other than just he's becoming the guy <laughs> that you just sort of expect to make the the critical contribution, um, regardless of the game he's having overall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think what really suits him about the right hand side um, is that basically because he's left footed, it means he just comes inside, mm. <laughs> and so he comes into the centre. And you know, where does he score his goal? Like he, he has two, I think, really big chances in this game the goal he also has that one he kind of drags a little bit in the second half which um which for me is a slightly better chance than maybe the second Abamyang one very similar like he just he just doesn't catch it and he drags it and and I expected him to score because yeah he's, he's just one of those players you have high standards for but I I kind of I the reason I like him on the right now is is that he he doesn't stay there? <laughs> mm. He just like he comes in field, and 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 that's what you want when when you've got a wide player who's really influential. Like I always say, like Robert Perez was not 
like he wasn't scoring goals and making assists from out on the touchline and neither was Freddie Jungberg. Um, they were, they were coming in field and they were getting involved. And, and that's what I really like about Saka. Like he, he kind of started out, you know, when he was a left back and he was, he was very good at doing that. He was very good at getting up and down that left touchline. But I just think on the right, he just comes in field um, quite a bit more. And uh, we spoke about this on the instant reaction pod, like for the first Aubameyang chance, he's there as well in the six yard box he's really beginning to pick up those positions and yeah i mean he's he's becoming um he's becoming really talismanic um for arsenal he's he's a player you look to and that's that's incredibly rare in someone his age yeah <clears throat> and i mean i think i i think the the issue is that it seems impossible to rotate him out of the team i'm not even talking about in terms of him getting hurt you know anything like that just you want to make sure that he can continue to contribute at, at his maximum effectiveness. And I think because he's he's so decisive, even when he's not at his absolute best, it's easy to say he just has to be out there. But, you know, is there an argument against City? Maybe we'll, we'll come on to the City game in just a minute briefly, but I think there is an argument for saying, mm-hmm. we're not going to have as much of the ball, we're not going to be attacking as much, you know, can we play Pepe on the right? He's proven he can be effective against City on the counter. Give Saka a break yep. for the the crucial midweek second leg, um, and trust that you know playing a lot more on the counter attack, Pepe can do the job, and he's going to be a little more rested, having not played much on Thursday. One player who did get back into the game uh, after a long absence, it was nice to see Tierney back on the pitch. Tim, just briefly on Tierney, um, you saw immediately the difference wanting to push and get past a guy and and run beyond him, something that Cedric wasn't doing as much of, but. He looked rusty to me, and, and and understandably, he's been out for a bit. I thought we saw flashes of what Tierney will add that we have missed in terms of, you know, trying to get beyond the defender, trying to to beat a man and deliver the crosses. But unfortunately, when he got into some good positions in this game, his delivery was just miles off, just a little bit rusty. So mm-hmm. excited to Tierney see Tierney back. And did you notice anything just from the the time he was on the pitch about how it will be a little different with him in there? Yeah, I'm very, uh, very excited to see him back. Um, not least because we, you know, not playing Pepe, we just don't have a left footer um, down there. And, and and it does make a difference. And, you know, to Clive's point um, about us becoming suddenly very a, a lot more efficient when the goal came round and, and Cedric, you know, suddenly deciding that mm, actually maybe I will just cross this with my left foot. Um, and not mess about. And look, I, I you know, I don't, I don't want to necessarily have a go at Cedric about that. I do have a gripe about professional footballers in general not using their weaker foot but um that that's not really a cedric problem per se and he's not really a left back so i think you can cut in some slack there I, yeah and 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 actually i i kind of think that maybe this was just a useful appearance to get rid of some of that rust um and yeah we'll, we'll see if he if he plays against um plays against city um, on Sunday, I, I guess the the thing I'd say about like the front line is, yeah, I, I'd maybe look at giving Saka a rest and playing Pepe. I'd also look at playing Martinelli. I think if you're looking at, you know, playing on the counter um, and and not necessarily having a lot of touches, um, I, I think, you know, Pepe and Martinelli either side of um, of Aubameyang with Smith Rowe behind them kind of doing that, that pressy stuff. Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think that could have some mileage in it for Sunday. Yeah. Um, Clive, do you want to briefly touch on that? And then I I also want to just get to the substitutions because I think the Pepe Martinelli subs are interesting to me for a variety of reasons um, in terms of what they might say about the narrowing of the group that really is the sort of first choice group up front. But before we do that, do do you have anything to add on Tierney? I mean, it wasn't a particularly meaningful reemergence, but it's good to see him back. And I think he definitely will bring things to left back that, that Cedric wasn't really able to you know, not being a left back and all that. Yeah, he looked rusty, didn't he? Very he did rusty. look rusty. And, um, yep. Yeah, he was very gingerly when he was running early on, and then he got into it and warmed up and got into it. So it makes you wonder what was really going on with that injury, Elliot. I know you were suspicious and worried and concerned about a double leg amputation, for example, but basically I thought he was, you know, he was very rusty. And, um, but hey, he looks, looks back. But we've got a lot of games coming. I'm be interested to see what they do on Sunday. There's no guarantees, right? No one will see how he reacts. But hopefully he'll start on Sunday. Yeah, so then let's talk about the Pepe and Martinelli subs. Um, I listened to the instant reaction. I know Tim had some some complaints, I think, in particular with Martinelli going into center forward. Look, I think if Aubameyang plays the 90 minutes, we probably get another goal. 
I think to some extent, Arteta not waved a white flag, but signaled that he was okay if we wound up with a draw in this game. I'm not saying that's what he wanted. I mean, he put on players who are capable of absolutely impacting the game in a major way. I think there was a little bit of an eye towards the weekend, and I think he understood with an away goal and a draw, we were in okay shape, although last season would beg to differ. Um, it, it's curious to me because it's it's not Lacazette that comes on. Willian does get his appearance bonus, thankfully, but by the time he's on, I mean, the, the game is totally over. I thought those last two subs were literally just to see the game out and, and in short ended at a draw at that point. So do you think that the introduction of Martinelli and Pepe there are an indication of narrowing that group of players that are now really in contention to be contributors in the front line, that it's Saka, Oba, Smithrow, Pepe, and Martinelli. Um, you know, we haven't seen much of Lacazette, or do you think that this was an opportunity to get those guys, in particular Martinelli, playing time because the manager maybe doesn't see much of that on the horizon? How do you, how do you feel about that particular switch? I thought it was very interesting to see Martinelli yeah. go in it at... Um, at center forward because, you know, we haven't really seen him there. And suddenly, there he is. Yeah, I, I wonder if he did. Maybe it was just to get some minutes in him because he's he's not really come on that much. And Lacazette, um, you know, Lacazette's 29 and he's played plenty this season. So even though we haven't seen him in the last couple of games, like, um, you know, you don't worry as much about him um, you know, growing rust um, as it were, or getting roots in his boots. Um and, and also Lacazette, like quite frankly, quite often looks knackered after 70 minutes anyway. So maybe a couple of games off is all right. I, I wonder if he did it just because Martinelli is, he felt the most analogous player that he has to Aubameyang. Um, and point, yeah. he seems to have a real reluctance to ever play them together. And maybe he just thought, okay, well, I'm taking Aubameyang off now. And therefore, this is my chance to give Martinelli minutes because I just can't stomach the idea of them being on the pitch at the same time. Um, which, which like, I get because it hasn't worked yet. I do think there's potential there for it to work. I just think it needs some working on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I found, yeah, I, I said it on the instant reaction pod anyway, I found it weird and I, I, th- I, I thought it was going to kill us and, and, and it kind of did because... Like I'm a fan of the idea of Martinelli up front, but I think I don't think it's something you introduce in like the 75th minute of a European tie when you're drawing one-one. Like I, I don't think you do that. I think you, I, I think you that's something that's going to have to happen slowly. Like maybe a couple of Euro- Europa League group games there or maybe you just make a decision at the start of a season, a bit like we did with Van Persie when we made him a lone striker and we just went right, we're doing this now. Uh, you know, Wenger was like, we're doing this now. That's your position. Go and play it. And it took, uh, I think it took Man Percy four games to score. And then it just clicked because they stuck with it. So I think you've either got to do that or just give him like cup games, Europa Europa League group games. I don't think you, you throw him in cold like this, particularly when he hasn't played for a little while. So like as much as I like the idea of Martinelli as a centre forward in the future, I, I didn't think that this was particularly the time for it. Um, and, and actually, given how deep um, Benfica had gone, maybe it was it would have been a good a better time for Lacazette just because he comes short. And, you know, can you maybe draw them out a little bit? Can you tempt Ot- Otamendi out, um, you know, and either get a free kick or tempt him away from from his position so someone can run in behind? Um, I, I don't know. But, yeah, I it, it to me. It felt like um, it felt a little bit like a substitution by numbers. It felt like a, well, I haven't put him on in a while because I haven't been able to take Aubameyang off. Aubameyang's off now, so I'm going to throw him on, and I've kind of got to put Pepe on as well. And um, what am I going to do here, kind of thing? Like, I, I still, I still don't think like. Uh, maybe this happens i don't know but you know when people always had that criticism of wenger like his his subs are pre-planned like i think your subs kind of should be pre-planned to an extent um dependent on the game state though i think that's just what coaches do it's just like right if it's 1-1 after 70 minutes i'll put this player here but if it's um you know if we're 1-0 down after 70 minutes i'll do you know having like different scenarios and i i'm just not convinced arteta has that and i still would really like a coach 
um, at Arsenal who has been in that position. I know Steve Round is a very experienced coach. He's never been a manager. I'd really like someone, um, and I know they're hard to get. It's hard to get a manager who's willing to go and be an assistant, but I'd just really like to get someone on that bench who's who's been there and done that before and made substitutions and, and done things that are game-changing or, or just someone to say to him, yeah, do you know what? Just throw on all the fucking strikers. It's fine. We can do that. Um, and I'm, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure that that he really that he has that voice there. Um, and and I felt I felt that showed in in this substitution in particular. Yeah. And and Clive, I mean, what I can't decide is, did he throw on Martinelli here? As Tim says, because it's a chance to use him and Oba's off, and they're kind of similar, and he hasn't used him in a while, so he had to get him on. Or does he throw him on here because? Martinelli is genuinely starting to now come back into his plans as even potentially ahead of Lacazette in the pecking order. I I think it may be more the former than the latter. I mean, I think Pepe coming on reflects the fact that he has every right to claim that left wing spot for his own. And I think Smith Rowe, it's not that he did anything wrong. I'm not sure he's as made for that position. I mean, I realize why it's no. interesting playing Smith Rowe and Odegaard together, but I think unfortunately, more often than not, Arteta is going to be forced to choose one or the other. And really, unfortunately, is that Odegaard has looked very good and Smith Rowe has looked very good. And who would want to be a manager? That's a tough call. So I'm curious. I mean, it it is a little bit concerning that we didn't have a shot after the 71st minute. And, you know, you bring on two very dynamic players in Pepe and Martinelli. Martinelli didn't have a touch. Now, part of the problem is Tierney had a couple chances to find him in the box and was rusty and, and didn't deliver. You know, Pepe didn't look particularly effective. And I, I thought the game petered out. We really stopped getting the ball to Odegaard. It, it, it just all sort of closed down. Um... Do you have thoughts on why he picked the players he did and why it didn't work? <laughs> <laughs> right, look, where should we start? So, um, yeah, I thought it's significant that Martelli came on centre forward because the last time we saw him was a game he got dragged off at half time. Was it Man United? Man United. Was yep. it? For William, yeah. no less. <laughs> yeah, dragged off at half time playing wide left. Comes on this game, centre forward. Is this a new phase in his development? Maybe. Maybe, you know, and let's start it. Let's start it now. This is not a player that's here for two minutes. He's here for five plus years. So, and a lot of people think he's going to be a centre forward. Uh, time maybe, I think he's going to be like a Danny Ings type centre forward. That's my little one for the future. A, a banging shooter, quick, inventive shooter, quite sprinty, gets in around people, creates chances with sharp movement in small spaces. I think that's what he's going to end up being like. Um, in, and so, yeah, why not start it? I'm not to worry about the game scenario, really. I just think I want to see him on the pitch a bit more. That's the main thing. Um, Odegaard and Smith Rowe, I think they should be competing for an interior position. I think Smith Rowe's going to end up, be, you know, as, a, as an eight eventually. I know he's an eight ten at the moment. Um, Odegaard seems to be developing a relationship with Aubameyang, and Smith Rowe started his career as a ten with Lacazette. That maybe tells you Smith Rowe likes a setter. He likes to set people, bounce board off people, bounce and move. Rodegaard wants to slip slip through. So it's important you have running forwards when you play him. No people coming to him too much. Have people prepared to run through lines. And when they run through lines, he will find you. Right. So I think we are developing a core group. The problem is one of those core groups doesn't belong to us in Rodegaard. We're interested to see what happens. We've got two room two players here. Which one are we going to go to try to buy or are we going to try to buy both of them? We'll see how that develops, but Martinelli, I just want to see him on the pitch. I want to see him on the pitch a bit more. I don't care if he's 20 minutes here, 20 minutes there. I do think it'd be great for him to play on Sunday. I think he suits that team in a game where we're going to spend time off the ball, and he's an incredibly fit player. And I thought him and Pepe both looked fresh when they came on. They were really fresh. And, and as for substitution in general, um, I don't think it's something you ever get right. You know, it's all dependent on the outcome. You know, I think Arteta has not shown it's a super strength. I don't like the way that certain people get marginalised sometimes on occasion for too long. You know, but that's I say that without knowing all the data and the information and the red zone information. But, you know, for people that like Rob Holding, what's he done? For people like Pepe, what's he done? Do, do you know what I mean? Mm. He'd be like, Lacazette was doing fine. He'd been put to the side. If you like those players... And you're not sure about the manager, you then judge him on that currency. You know what's happened, what's you know what's happened to people not in the squads like Nelson, for example. So, I think he leaves himself a little bit open there. I felt he didn't pick the right team to start with, which affected the substitution pattern. 
but I don't think it cost us his game. I thought the inefficiencies in the first 66 minutes or so was what cost us getting the result we should deserve. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think in our mind's eye, there are players we're very excited about. And when they come on, we expect it to be very exciting. And so Pepe and Martinelli, in particular, are two very talented players who I'm very excited about. And I was excited those were the changes, frankly. I was excited it wasn't Lacazette, that it was Martinelli. I was excited, obviously, that it wasn't Willie and it was Pepe. And they didn't do shit. <laughs> and sometimes that's really frustrating. There's nothing more frustrating than when, you know, you, you bring on guys that you're really excited about and they don't influence the game. They just didn't. This game petered out in a, in a, in a significant way. And I think this is a brutal season for everybody. An absolutely brutal run. And on a wet, heavy pitch after, you know, just a, a, a season that is grueling in every way and with a big game on the horizon on Sunday... You know, I, I, I do feel that we sort of took our foot off the gas in this game, or maybe our foot was taken off the gas just because our foot was asleep, to use a really bad analogy. Um, but yeah, it, did, it didn't materialize, and that was frustrating. I don't think it necessarily says anything about the, the quality of those players. I do think that, you, you know, to some extent, Tim, there there is a question about where Mikel Arteta's head is now in terms of Sunday... Sunday's importance and next Thursday's importance. I think he will feel frustrated that we didn't put away the chances in this game, obviously, because he could go into Sunday knowing that Thursday was just a a formality. You know, if this had ended 3-1, like it should have and could have, or 3-0, because that wasn't a penalty. Um, you know, he goes into Sunday as full strength as he wants to, and, and Thursday can be heavy rotation and just see it out. But that's not the case now. So with City coming up in the unique challenge they present, the fact that Arteta does have an ego and would love to get one over on Pep, his mentor, and the fact that mm-hmm. you know there's still some things in the league that are there for us, you might say, that we want to play for, but recognizing that getting knocked out of the Europa League is absolutely not an option, not something he can possibly countenance, how does he balance it? What's, what's the right way, or is there no balancing? Are we at the stage of the season right now where if you're called upon, you play and you play the best you can, and that's just it, tough shit? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I do, I do. I like. I, do, I don't. Um, I've said this many times. That I just. I don't really believe in prioritization until you get to that point where you're talking about. Well, if he pulls a hamstring, he's out the final or out the semi final or out for the season or whatever. Um, like that shouldn't happen before like April. Um, I don't think. Um, I, I think you need to keep momentum and rhythm. Um, and and also like when you're playing Man City, the thing is it's it's really difficult to get excited about Arsenal playing Man City because we pretty much know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's like the most predictable game in our calendar, I think, um, and the results show that. Um, certainly in the Premier League, anyway. Albeit we beat them in the FA Cup semi final last year, but you know we're like in the FA Cup, we're a different animal. Um, and so, like I, I just think gentle rotation um, is the way. Like I think we have come to a stage where in those forward positions we can change things around a bit. We can, you know, we've we've had Pepe and Lacazette like barely kick a ball in the last two games. Like they can come back in. They're they're not terrible footballers. Um, you know, we we've played with them plenty of times before and done good things. It, it's fine. Like we know the talent of Martinelli. We've we've now got a choice really if we want between Smith Rowe and, and Erdegaard. Like we've got options there. Um, I think central midfield is really the only place we don't have options. We've completely changed our centre halves in the last couple of games. In in Louise and Gabriel, who who were sat down um, for for a while, when Holding and Mari were playing well, now they're sitting down, and and I think that's all kind of fine. Um, and maybe with Tierney back, we can rotate Cedric and Bellerin. Like that, that for me, that's what I'm interested in. I'm I'm interested in coming to that stage. I don't want to go back to um, the thing that we used to have, perhaps, or have had for the last few seasons, where there's like the Europa League team and the Premier League team, and they're they're separate entities. Like I don't think we want that. I think what we want is to be in a position where hopefully keep going in the Europa League, so we are having games every every kind of three or four days, so that we can just plug in so that we can make two changes a game for example and just keep going that way Mm -hmm. um i I think that's much more the way forward and and with them the particularly in the forward positions with the players we've got we can do different things with those players you know we could we can 
we can play in different ways with those players depending on um, the game plan we want to enact. If we want to press, if we don't want to press, if we want to counter, like we've got players that can pretty much do all of those things. And the only attacker, I think at the moment, that is just a bus that we can't use is Willian. Um, other than that, we've, we've even though we've we keep got using good him. options there, <laughs> even though we keep using him, yeah. Um, but but like that, we we've got some good options there. L- let's lean into that. Let's you know rotate the centre backs if and when you want to, depending on how you want to play. I think that's that's what I'm more interested in coming to that stage and coming to the stage where when we see a player come in, we're not talking about um, dropping or resting. Um, anymore that we just say, oh, okay, Martinelli's playing in this game today. Oh, Pepe's playing. Oh, Smith Rowe and Odegaard are playing, and, and we st- and we um, no no. And, and this is not like our fault as fans describing it that way. It's because that that's been very much the case for the last mm-hmm. the last kind of couple of seasons. But I, I want I want the progress of the team to stop that, or the progress of the squad rather to stop that sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I think look. For Aubameyang, for the team, this was an evening of missed opportunities. That's what this was. But the repercussions of that are are that it, it just makes a really tricky run that much trickier. City, Benfica, Leicester, it's tricky. And Clive, as a final thought, building on what Tim said, I think what has changed is that now there is a legitimate debate to be had over who should start, and it's not which terrible option, it's which good player. I mean, if I think back to the beginning of the season, we were really struggling to come up with who's even good enough to be in this team, but now, between Odegaard, Smith-Rowe, Pepe, Oba, Martinelli, and Saka, we've got a front four, right, a a three behind the one, where any combination of those players we'd probably feel pretty good about, right? So... That Mm. feels like the rotation of players. And I left Lacazette out intentionally because for me, and this is just me. Congrats, you mentioned him. Well, for for me, and the funny thing is he's our our top scorer. Yeah, exactly. But but for me, I think it is pretty clear that we create the better chances and have the better chance to score goals with, with Aubameyang up front or with these other players than we do with Lacazette. And I think that Lacazette's usefulness now that there is a 10 is limited because he still just does not get shots off as much. And we don't need him as involved in build-up. That doesn't mean he won't be used, and that doesn't mean he's useless. But so, I guess as you look ahead to the City game, a game where we'll probably be pushed back, probably not have as much possession, and given that the Benfica tie is, is I think, just slightly more important, can he afford to go with a lineup that some people might be frustrated because it might mean leaving out some of our best players, but do it recognizing that if we keep it tight and, and try to counter, that that may be the way to go. So it could be an Odegaard, trying to play on the counter into an Aubameyang and a Pepe, but maybe Saka gets a rest, and maybe ESR gets a rest, and it's Pepe, Aubameyang, and I, I hate to mention William, Pepe, Aubameyang, and Martinelli as the front three, you know, or, or the three behind the, uh, you know, maybe it's Odegaard, uh, Pepe, and Martinelli with Aubameyang up front. That leaves Saka out. It leaves Smith Rowe out. It keeps them fresh for Benfica. It still gives us plenty of counterattacking options. You probably can't rush party back yet, so you go with Ceballos and Shaq again and just tell them to you know keep it safe, get it to Odegaard and let him play on the counter. Maybe you even play Cedric. You give Tierney a little more rest in a game where he's not going to be overlapping and bombing forward. And you just tell Cedric to stay back. And, and you play this one tight, and you try to let that f- group of four players, Odegaard, Oba, Pepe, and Martinelli, find a way to unlock City on the counterattack. I mean, is that is that such a bad approach to have Sack and Smith Rowe fresh for Thursday to protect Party and Tierney and recognize that it was going to be tough under any circumstances to get a result against City? And if we do it, it'll most likely be on the counter anyway. Or am I, am I oversimplifying this in suggesting that you can just have f- you know, four counterattacking players and let the rest be damned? He did make me laugh when you ask me these questions and, and take all the options. <laughs> so, so, so let me say this. If I say all the words in the English language, what would your reaction be to that? Now add to that, please. <laughs> uh, I was laughing. Right, so you got one or two choices, right? So obviously he knows who's got the fresh legs and, um, you know, maybe he takes the game in. Uh, you know, this is what I would do. You look at it and say, I take, do you take the game in two phases? And you know what? I want secure players on the ball early in the early phases, particularly in, in the central zone. And then maybe I play, you know, easy see Lacazette playing in this game. And 
with a, a, t a 10, whether it's with for our Odegaard, and two behind. So you create a block there, and you attack from the wide striker's area. So you say for maybe Martelli and Pepe, can you can you work from the sides? Look up, make sure they stay on this back there because they build up in a in a three two five or sometimes a three um, sorry a, a three four sorry a three two five sometimes. That's the one. Yeah, they bring or two left around and they basically. So, but when it comes down to it. The key thing for me, what I would do, is really try to hold on to the principles we saw at Leeds. So don't change. If we're going to be somebody, let's be that person. If we lose this game, no one, no one's going to be surprised, right? So let's focus on being who we are. And in most of the games since Christmas, we've been really competitive. We haven't been dominated by anybody. And then that's why we've been, we carry frustrations with a draw, you know? Um, let's not talk about walls and Villa, right? So we haven't been dominated by anybody which means our spacing is better, our build-up is better. It could even be better. We could be more efficient in the box, could be more ruthless in our build-up, more ruthless in the box. We know all this stuff. But now we're, we're getting to start to talk about the right stuff in football, not the things we were talking about, conceding shots, passing backwards. So that came back a bit last night because it was too easy. Passing backwards, not recognising, no connectivity, nothing. So that's where we were pre-Christmas, right? No confidence a lot. So we've got a lot of this thing going on. Can we just go back to our principles? Make sure we press when we lose the ball. Don't think they're better than they actually are. You've got to press them into mistakes. So a high-energy team, a high-energy front end, make sure we work hard, but make sure we focus on our build-up, focus on our distances, make them counter-foul us, get them in the book. Don't go into these games with an inferiority complex. Right? Go out there, control the football, control your distances, look for your relationships. That's what I would say. Make sure that in this game you can still see the Arsenal team that's been developing since the Chelsea game. Don't be something else because it's Man City. If you lose a game, fine. The next game, be that team again. And be that team versus Leicester. And that's the way forward for us. It's not completely getting scared and moving away from who we actually are. Yeah, well said. I think that should do it. Uh, because we play in not very long. <laughs> And then we have an instant reaction pod after that and a full pod after that and on and on and the world keeps on spinning. So let's leave it there. It, it will be interesting to see how we measure up against City. I feel that it comes at an unfortunate time in a way because maybe we're just stretched now a little bit in terms of the fatigue in the in the side. And look, everybody is, but City have the talent where they can rotate out a, you know half their 11 and put players in that would start for every team in the league. So they have that advantage uh, of depth that we just don't have, which is unfortunate. But you know what? We we still have a lot of talent. I th I still think the trajectory is 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 the right trajectory, even if this game disappointed us. Um, I, I definitely think we we miss Thomas Party, obviously, as you're going to. And my only hope is that uh, he is back for Thursday. I'm I'm fine if we don't want to rush him back for this weekend. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Tim's on Twitter. Shoburto, thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC, thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Elliot Smith, Bob, and Twitter, Ian Gunner. If you'd like to give us a five-star review, or really any review, whatever, is, it should be an honest review, but we we would appreciate it. I mean, I I think it's one of those things where the podcast apps don't make it easy, so then it's like you have to go hunt for it and find it. So if you want to do it, great. If it's a big pain in the neck, yeah, it's not the end of the world. The most important thing is that we've gotten you uh, clean, shaven, and did privates and smelling good, so that's good. Uh, we do love you. We really appreciate you being here for, for all the stuff we do, and we will be back with more after... Um, the scoreline that I'm about to call out that Tim attempted to call out after the instant reaction pod and nearly burst into laughter. It's not easy as it looks, Tim, to say. We love you. We will talk to you after <laughs> Arsenal 10, City Mills.